This comes from 2 Samuel 11. Hear now the word of God. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Ramah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman, it was reported. This is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. This is the word of God for all the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, we ask now that we would hear your voice, that you would direct our steps. We pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts will be acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I feel like I had been gone for a month, and it was only just last week, but we had crammed so much into the, the week of Labor Day and then the short week that happens after Labor Day that it feels like that I have been away from you for a very long time. And I, I want you to know that I missed you last week. I did sleep until 7 o'clock in the morning. And so for me on a Sunday morning, that was two extra hours. And I, when I awakened, I did, I did pray for all of you. And for Sydney, I thank her for doing, as she called it, the preacher shuffle back and forth in the two later services. I always call that circuit riding. But I know that you had a marvelous time as well. And, and when we awakened the next day, we found out that September was here. And September means that we are making a turn towards the busiest time of the year for so many of us, and especially for the church. You heard what all is going on in the announcements this morning and then also in our mission moment. I want to encourage you seriously to, to walk through the ministry fair during the, the Sunday school hour. And I apologize right up front to all those Sunday school teachers who have planned a lesson like the person I live with when I left this morning. He had all of his stuff out preparing a lesson for this morning, and I gently reminded him that a lot of the Sunday school class members would be in the Welcome Center in the ministry fair, and so I'm sure I'll hear more about that later when I get home. <laughs> but we also are beginning Logos. This is our children and youth Wednesday evening ministry that we have been doing for almost 30 years. 30 years. Logos has been shaping and forming the lives of thousands of children and, and young adults. And when we think about that and we think about how their lives have impacted others, the, the waves of faith that have gone out from this mission station through that ministry is, is unmeasurable. So I invite you to be a part of that, either, either with your children or grandchildren. We will be doing something a little bit different by expanding the dinner hour. And, and I'm going to do a short devotional at the end of that dinner hour. So we hope that we can bring our, our church family in for another opportunity to be together on Wednesday nights. <coughs> next, Saturday, next Sunday, we are going to be doing our... Our event in Union Park. You know, we try to we try to have an event there three or four times a year where we invite the neighborhood in and especially the the students at Lincoln. And I hope that you're already thinking about what ice cream you're going to make. Mine will probably be made by Brahms, but I understand that it will be just as tasty, if not more so, than anything I would make. And then on September 21st. Once a year, I want us to all be on the same page, and we are going to embark upon this year's all-church study revival by Adam Hamilton, the senior pastor at the Church of the Resurrection, one of the largest United Methodist churches in, in Christendom. And I think it's going to be a remarkable thing. We're going to be using this, uh, this small group study and the sermons we're going to be interweaving it through our Sunday school classes, through the small groups that meet at different times during the week. Our children and our youth are going to be looking at it as well. And I want to encourage you, if you are not currently a member of a small group, when you walk down those steps into the Welcome Center, the first 
that you're going to see is Liliana Shell standing there, signing people up, forming new groups, getting the books to you. And any of you who know Liliana, if you can say no to her, come back and tell me how, how to say no to her. But here's the reason that I think small groups are so important. First of all, we all have that desire to be a part of something that, that, that we, are, we are welcome to. They know when we're gone. They care about us. They walk with us through life. But also, it's that, that place where we can be held accountable, where our faith can grow, our discipleship can grow deeper. It's like the scripture says, iron sharpening iron. Don't miss that opportunity. And it's a great segue into our sermon this morning. That whole issue of accountability. We've been looking at the dysfunctional families of the Bible. And we began by looking at Abram and, Abram and Sarai. And we saw how lying and deception can, can absolutely reshift the focus of, of any family, of any life. And then last week, Sydney shared with you in the story of Joseph and his brothers what sibling rivalry can do to the fabric of a family. And today, we are going to look at the most cataclysmic fall that you can find in Scripture. When we look at David and the Scripture passage we just read, and there are a couple of things that are interesting about this whole thing, not the least of which is when everybody else was out on the battlefield, the king, David, somehow, someway, had decided to stay home. You know what the story is. You know that he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And, and the first thing that happened with everybody out of town is that he has this attraction to his neighbor, and in short order, David breaks several of the Ten Commandments. He covets another person's wife. He uh, sleeps with her. She gets pregnant. He lies about it. He makes sure that her husband is eliminated. And all kinds of things start taking place in that family. As a matter of fact, when we see the story of David progress through the rest of his life, we see that, that things have shifted so because of this, of this upheaval in his life. This time when he stepped away from what he knew was right, he shaped the lives of his children and of his children's children. What's really interesting is that when we read the story of David, even though in that time, in that place, in that culture, it was not uncommon to have multiple wives and lots of people in the harem, there's a reason that this story has been preserved through the years. And that reason is David's story is our story. We have all found ourselves on the opposite side of where we should be. When we have had a choice to make about morality, we have closed our eyes. We have found ourselves in the wrong place at the wrong time, and we have chosen a path of destruction. And it doesn't have to be an adulterous affair. It doesn't have to be murder. David was just quite, quite busy at that time in his life. But there are times when we recognize that there is that plumb line that, that Amos talks about, and we step away from the plumb line. And as soon as we start making those decisions to step away, it's difficult to find our way back. <coughs> Jesus, in that classic encounter, Pharisees bring this woman to him who's been caught with another man, not her husband. And they demand justice. There was a prescribed way that that needed to be taken care of. And so Jesus starts writing something in the sand and then very quietly says, okay, whichever one of y'all is not sinned, you just go ahead and start throwing that stone. One by one, they walked away because they understood that they, too,
to a cross that moral line. We see that. And we see the life of David. And we think that this person who was God's anointed could find himself so far afield, how much easier is it for us? Well, what's interesting about what takes place in, in David's life, that iron sharpening iron, that accountability issue. In the next chapter, his really good friend Nathan comes to talk to him. And Nathan knows what's taken place. And you can imagine how Nathan is feeling. His dear, dear friend has really made a mess of things. He had turned a blind eye to what he should have done. And so Nathan has to go and talk to David about what are you going to do? How are you going to find your way back? And so he uses what I consider to be a clever way of addressing the issue. And he begins by telling David, a shepherd, about this man, this poor farmer who had one little sheep. And some rich guy shows up and takes that sheep away. And now the man has nothing. As a matter of fact, the man is sick to death. Well, David, who's been able to compartmentalize his life in such a great fashion, becomes incensed. He, he can't believe it. He, he is just outraged. Someone has taken that little new lamb and he, he decrees, go ahead and read it in that next chapter, he decrees a fourfold punishment for the person who took someone else's lamb. And Nathan says to David, you're that guy. David is immediately crushed. What is the effect on his family? What is the effect on our families, on our relationships, when we too turn a blind eye and start down the wrong path? The effect on our families is like a, we don't do it in a vacuum. So whenever we take a step away from what we know is the right thing to do, our families in one form or fashion are dragged with us. And it, it becomes for them a dysfunctional system where, where right is no longer the thing that is the focus of the family. As soon as we start lying, as soon as we start telling half-truths, as soon as we start hedging on what is morally correct, there is damage effect on our families and on our relationships. I can't imagine how sad Nathan must have been. Someone he had held up in the highest esteem. The boy who took care of the Philistine giant, the boy who became king, the king who danced with joy as the Ark of the Covenant was brought, brought back into Jerusalem. The one thing we understand when we see Nathan coming to David is that suddenly David has this recognition of what has taken place. He recognizes that he has turned away from God in this, in this selfish pursuit of something that, that wasn't his, that, that wasn't right. He knew that he was a man after God's own heart. He knew that he was anointed, and yet in this recognition, he becomes a broken person. And you know, I think that that's why we can't turn our eyes away from David and, and, and the recognition of, of what took place. We don't wake up in the morning and think, today I'm going to ruin my life. We start with small decisions and small steps away from what we know is right. And we find ourselves far afield in, in that recognition that we have stepped away, we too become broken. And the second thing we see with David is 
He was repentant. The recognition of what he had done, the sin that he had committed, that the things that he had he had taken advantage of, and, and what was taking place within his kingdom and within his own household. He repented of that. Repent means literally to turn away, to never go that way again, to, to mark your steps in as fast as you can kind of direction away from where you were. And I find it compelling that the song we use during Lent was written by David after Nathan had approached him. Listen to what he said. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so you are right in your verdict, and justified when you judge. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. My sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. Recognition, repentance, and the end of that psalm road to restoration. You know, David never expected to receive restoration. He did not think he was worthy of restoration. He knew that he had to ask for forgiveness after he recognized how far afield he had gone. But we see in restoration that God had a different plan for David. David had a son named Jedediah, God's beloved. And then his son Solomon was the one who finally was able to construct the beautiful temple that David had envisioned. The restoration of David, but also the restoration of part of his family. And it is the ultimate restoration to David that many generations later in his own line of descendants the Messiah was born. David recognized and repented and was restored. So the hope for us today is that when we find ourselves on the wrong place at the wrong time, whether it's a rooftop or it's in, it's in a basement floor, whether it's in something we, we allow to happen or something we make happen, there is hope of restoration for us. We too can find ourselves so far afield but God continues to call us. God continues to call us to be restored. You know, I heard someone say once that we can alter God's plans for us with our actions, but we can't ruin it. And when we come to this table of grace in a few moments, there is no greater place to receive that restoration than here. Where we pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit it becomes for us the body and blood of Christ. One thing that David learned, and I pray that you will take into your hearts. Because I don't know where all of you are at this moment. I don't know if there are any of you who have taken steps away from where you should be. But what you need to hear 
is that whatever it is, it's forgiven. And whatever happened is forgotten. And it is forever that we are offered grace to come back to the place where we find God. Forgiven, forgotten, forever, leave it at this table. Those who have ears, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. For it's in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.